We just thank you for your presence with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I'm excited because we have not one, not two, but three sermon introductions all kind of wrapped into one. So if you're looking at me in about three minutes and going, is he getting somewhere? The answer is yes. Just give me a minute. (laughs) So we're headed for uh, through our series. Our Our series has been called Greater Than as we head towards Easter. And what we've been talking about is is different things that Jesus is greater than. Because something that I've noticed in conversations that I've had in my time in ministry is that uh, a lot of different things sometimes get lumped in with Christianity. Uh, And as we try to figure out how to follow Jesus and how to talk about our faith, sometimes it gets a little bit difficult because of the perception or the way that things people think. So we spent a little bit of time talking about buildings. Because some people look at faith or Christianity just as the building, the place you go, right? Right? Um, You come in, you leave. I told the story a few weeks ago of a friend of mine who uh, came into a church for the first time. He had been there in like 15 or 20 years, and he was afraid he was going to get shot by lightning the moment he walked in the door. And he was dead serious. He was very concerned because he thought, you know, this is where Jesus is, and and he can't see me anywhere else, but this is the spot. Um, And so we kind of talked a little bit about through that and, and how Christ transcends the building or just the place that we worship. Uh, next week, we're going to talk a little bit about leaders. We've seen a lot of things in the news and conversations lately about different Christian leaders that have um, had some trouble, and that actually changes the perspective and um, how people view Christianity as a whole from the outside. So we're, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that because Christ really is greater than uh, just the leaders that are in the church today. We talked about a little bit about Scripture a couple weeks ago. We talked about good deeds. And the kind of the whole point is, is that all of these things are, are a part of our faith, certainly. But they're not the hub of the wheel. They're not the central part. The thing that we need to be focusing on is Christ and the things that he taught us and what he did for us on the cross as we move towards Easter. And so this is the same with today's topics. Today's topic, we're going to just scratch the surface a little bit on this idea of politics. We're going to talk about how Jesus, I heard a couple of giggles. Yes, I mean, last week I said this is going to be my last sermon. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Right? Um, so there's a couple of things that I just want us to keep in mind. The first one is this, uh, and we say this a lot, you know, in our staff meetings and whatever. Uh, if you hear something you don't like this morning, which, I don't know, could happen, um, let's just lean into that feeling a little bit before we sort of lean back, get defensive, and try to establish an argument in our own brain. Let's lean into why we felt that way and actually examine that a little bit deeper because there's going to be maybe a little bit, maybe not as much discomfort this morning as there could be, but there's going to be a little bit. Um, And here's the second thing. This is a big topic. So I'm going to, I don't usually talk up here for more than 20 or 25 minutes. I try not to. This is probably a sermon series of like 45-minute sermons over like a six- or eight-week stretch. I'm not going to do that today, right? Yes, you're going to be here till 4.30. No, Um, right? There's going to be a lot of meat left on the bone today. We're going to kind of do a bit of a survey, a more of an overview, and that's intentional because I'd really love for you to go home through the perspective of a couple of the things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, and have a peek at that and see how you can find that through other parts of Scripture um, and through other parts of your life. So that's sort of the two intros. Uh, And then here's the third one. Uh, This is one of those weeks where I'm going to give you the bottom line right up front. So again, I do this every once in a while. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you were up last night watching WrestleMania. Was anybody doing that? No, just me. Good. Wonderful. It's okay, it's a two-nighter. You can watch it tonight if you want. (laughs) Starts at 8, come on over to my house. Uh, So uh, if you were up late, if you were, you know, building something or you were were out watching music or maybe you were just just tired, 
you can kind of pay attention for the first five or six minutes this morning. You can check out and you can probably still have a reasonable conversation about what I talked about. Because I'm going to give you sort of the bottom line, the way we're going at the end, we're going to get there right up front this morning. And here's the bottom line. Here's the thing that I want us to grab onto. Here's, here's the concept. Jesus is greater than politics because Jesus came to establish something new, not help something old. Jesus is greater than politics because he came to establish something new, not help something old. Can we all, let's, let's do the thing where we all say that together. And then you'll have all said it at least once and then we'll do it. Okay, so let's say that. Jesus is greater than politics because Jesus came to establish something new, not help something old. Okay, so now that we know the concept of the whole sermon, we can just jump right into practically how do we actually take this concept, and how do we work that into our day-to-day life? How do we leave this morning and actually do something with that? So let's talk about that for a minute. First of all, when we insert Jesus into our political system, generally we're inserting him into a system that he never intended to be a part of um, in the first place, (laughs) right? Again, this is one of those things where we just, we need to step and hold for a second. When we insert Jesus into our political systems, what we're doing is we're inserting him into a system that he never intended to be a part of uh, in the first place. And you know what? Everybody does this. So many people do this. It's going to be an election season around here. So I thought about this. I thought, could I use examples? Do I take, you know, it takes like six seconds to Google image this. I I saw a, a picture this week of a woman standing beside her She's in a gubernatorial race, her bus, uh, and it's this giant bus with a big flag on it, uh, and the, the three points, it says, family, Jesus, guns. That's what it says, right? Super. I know what you're all about. Um, but we do this all the time, right? We, we take concepts, we take either biblical concepts or we take something that Jesus said and we try to morph it into like this bubble that fits. And politicians do this. Um, they do it all the time. And it's interesting because uh, faith-based politicians do this. But so do people that don't have faith or establish with the faith. They do this too because they try to make the argument um, the other way. So I guess in a way it's nice that people want Jesus' endorsement. Uh, but the other side of it is that's not really what he came to do. That's not really a, a good fit. Jesus didn't really fit any of the political systems of his day when he came in, nor uh, does he necessarily fit any of the political systems of our day, even though we keep trying to shoehorn him in there all the time. And this is why. It's because when Jesus came, he came to establish something different. He came to establish what he talked about a lot as a different kingdom, a new kingdom. Now, that language in itself was a little bit political, Just in the sense that today, you know, now we talk in like countries or regions or provinces or states uh, or what have you. Uh, But then the language was kingdom language. So uh, if somebody were to come in and say, I'm in your country to establish a new country, somebody would go, oh. So, So there's a little bit of that there. But Jesus wasn't coming in to win or take over or pull for one side or another. Jesus was here to actually establish something new. And there's a lot of different places in Scripture where we can see that, but since we're heading into Easter, let's use this example from Scripture in John chapter uh, 18. Uh, Let's just go from here, starting in verse 28. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus to Caiaphas, to the palace of the Roman governor. So Caiaphas is the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, They did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. First of all, before we go any further, this is just an interesting thought. You don't think that like religion and politics were closely intertwined back in this time period? The governor, understanding that these religious leaders wouldn't enter the building because it would make them ceremonial unclean in their own religious state, came to them in order to help them do that. Do you know what I'm saying? Like that in itself is like, that's kind of like a woe thing. It's not really relevant to what we're talking about this morning, but I just thought that was interesting. I like to do that. So Pilate came out to them, verse 29, Pilate came out to them and asked, 
what charges are you bringing against this man? This man being Jesus. If he were not a criminal, they replied, the Jewish leaders, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your law. And then they said, but we have no right to execute anyone. And then verse 32 says, this took place to fulfill what Jesus has said about the kind of death he was going to die. So this back and forth between the Jewish leaders and Pilate. The Jewish leaders say, hey, this guy's a criminal. And Pilate says, well, what did he do? And they said, well, if he wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you. And Pilate goes, okay, but he's breaking your laws, not the ones that I'm overseeing, so why don't you punish him? And they go, well, we can't put him to death, but you can do that. So it's like this kind of weird little back and forth, right? It's, 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 you know, it is what it is. And then John, and this is why you'll notice I do this. I stop halfway through Scripture and I give a little bit of commentary. I feel okay doing that every once in a while because John does it. That's what verse 32 is. John takes a minute from the story and goes, and this took place to fulfill what Jesus has said about the kind of death that he was going to die, right? So if the Jewish leaders come and punish him, they don't actually have the authority or the ability to hang him on the cross the way the Romans did. And so John says this was actually necessary and important in order to fulfill the prophecies that were uh, spoken before. Verse 33, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is this your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Uh, Pilate replied, am I a Jew? Pilate replied, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is this that you have done? And Jesus said, and this is that key verse here, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus is saying here that I didn't come, I'm being accused of being king of the Jews, but I'm not trying to be king of this one small group. My kingdom that I'm here to establish is a lot bigger than that. It's different than that. It's outside what we are in right now and what you understand as your system. And just so that you know I'm not cherry picking and, you know, kind of spotting up one spot out of here, there's a lot of places in Scripture that refer to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Matthew and Luke record Jesus' message as the gospel or glad tidings in Matthew 4 in Luke 8, uh, Matthew refers to the kingdom of heaven in chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 10, chapter 19 and 20. Paul calls it the kingdom of Christ and God in Ephesians. Um, we look at parables a lot. A lot of times Jesus starts a parable with uh, the kingdom of heaven is like when he tells a story, uh, something like that. After training his 12 disciples in Luke 9, Jesus sends them out to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. After his crucifixion, which we're going to get to in a few weeks, Jesus appeared to his disciples and said to speak of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That's Acts chapter 1. And then later Paul describes his ministry as preaching the kingdom of God. And he does that all over Acts and 1 Corinthians and Colossians and all different kinds of places. This is a well-established theme. And we're not going to spend too much time talking about many other... Like we can talk about other political stories or stories that were politically charged that we read about biblically, you know, things like turning the tables and that sort of thing. But what I'd like us to do, and when you go home and through your week or through your devotions and what you do, what I'd like you to do is start reading some of those things through this theme and remind yourself that Jesus didn't come to pick a side or to be part of one political party or another, but Jesus came to actually establish a new kingdom that was better. He was teaching something bigger. He was teaching something different. And so here's where we get into trouble. And we do this all the time. We get into trouble when we try to use Jesus to win at what we're doing in our kingdoms. Right? We get in trouble when we try to use Jesus to win at what we're doing in our kingdoms. Instead of remembering that actually Jesus came to create something new and something different outside of what we're up to. When we try to insert Jesus into our political systems, it's kind of like putting a square peg in a round hole. It just doesn't, it just doesn't fit. It kind of fits. You can hammer it in there. I remember being a kid. Um, my dad, uh, 
my dad was great. He's like my favorite person. And, um, you know, we would sit and watch commercials and talk about them or whatever. And there's this one Pep Boys commercial. Does anybody know about Pep Boys? They're like a mechanic from way back. And it's these two guys, and they're, they're over an engine. And this guy's got like a sledgehammer, and he's just like hammering something into this engine. And the owner goes, are you sure that's the right part? And the, the mechanic goes, yeah, don't worry. We're going to make it fit. And then it flashes back to when these two mechanics were kids, and they're hammering a square pig into a round hole. And they're going, we're going to make it fit. We're going to make it fit. And there's like splinters everywhere, and everything's breaking. And of course, it flashes back, and the people are like, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with. <laughs> we're going to make it fit. And we can look at other parts of our life and we can go, yeah, you know, we make things fit, but, but we know it's not right. But this is one of those areas where we do this all the time. We take biblical concepts or we take something and we try to morph it into our political ideology or the way we view a particular issue or a party or a political candidate. We're going to see this coming up in the next little while. We're going to have a provincial election in the next few weeks. You know, let's play Jesus Bible bingo and see how many times people from all three major political or four political political parties uh, use or reference God and what they're trying to do and trying to make a point. I, we shouldn't actually do that. It would be sad. But you should do it in your head and go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah. I don't know about that one. And what's interesting is that you'll go, Oh, yeah, I'm not sure. And somebody else will read the same thing and go, Oh, yeah, <laughs> all right, that fits. And this is the problem is, is actually Jesus came to establish something new that didn't fit any of it because the new thing that he was creating was so much uh, different. I'm not sure. I, I, I've got one more. And again, this is going to be one of those sermons where there isn't a whole lot more than this. I just want to make sure I take the one the one point, and I really drive it home really hard because it's the themes so often that if we can get that theme down, then we can look at the practical applications through our lives and go, how does this affect everything else? So I think I've got some volunteers. Do I have volunteers? Steve, I know you're one of them. I've got a couple. Okay, yeah, right. Uh, Avril's coming up, and Sam, can everybody give Avril and Sam and Steve a hand? So you guys have some games in front of you, and I just want you to start uh, playing. So just start. You can, you've each been given a game to play. You can just play the games. And so while you do that, I'm just going to talk about this concept. Here's the way we try to use Jesus politically. We try to use him to win. <laughs> we try to leverage some biblical concept or something that God said and taught us, and we try to insert it into the things that we're doing. We talked about this a few weeks ago. A theology through ideology as opposed to the other way around and we try to use it to win the problem with that is that when we do that we don't actually have a concept of what winning and losing looks like or how to have a conversation about it or how to objectively decide when that's actually happened so it's kind of like when you have three people playing three completely different games by themselves and then I walk over and I say, okay, can you guys stop for a second? And then first I walk over to Sam. Sam, right? Oh, good. Okay. Whew. You can take this. And I go, Sam, the three of you are playing. You're playing Monopoly. Steve's playing Uno. Avril's playing Trouble. Who won? I did. You won. Yes. You beat the other two. Yeah, I did. Can you tell me how and why that happened? Well, first of all, I have more property. I have a lot of money. I'm older than that one, and I just beat Steve. <laughs> That's great. That's good. Okay, please hand the microphone to Steve. Steve, you're playing Uno. Mm -hmm. Who do you think won? I did. You <laughs> Steve just beat you, I apparently. Did. I did. Why did you win, Steve? Um, because I had all the right cards, and I played them really, really well. Mm. Intellect. <laughs> That's great. Okay, you can hand the mic over to Avril. Avril, yeah. how you doing? I'm doing good. Good? It's okay. You just either talk loud or hold it close. Okay. One or the other. Okay. 
Uh, you were playing Trouble. Yeah. It looks like maybe you were all the colors. Um, well, <laughs> I was red, but then I won so quickly that I just decided to be the other colors too. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, how is it that you won? Who did you beat? Why did you win the game? How did that work? Well, I beat Sam because um, red, my red color got around the board faster than she got all her properties. Right. And um, I beat Steve because I'm just better than Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, got, I got home before he laid his two last cards down, so I won. Right. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Uh, can everybody give a hand to all three of our game partners? You know what I'm getting at here, right? How do we do this? How do we know who wins? How do, we, how do we take, well, uh, yeah, okay, I'm not going to do this, but let's take a political party. Let's say this is one, and this is another one, and, and this is another one. And, well, Jesus said, Jesus aligns with our stuff here, so, so Jesus must tell you to vote for this party. Well, Jesus aligns with this stuff over here, so Jesus must be a part of this party. Well, Jesus aligns with this stuff over here, so he must be a part of this party. Well, well, was Jesus wrong here and here if Steve, come on, Steve didn't win. But if he did. Uh, <laughs> I feel so bad. I texted him on the way in. I'm like, I've got an object lesson. I need you to find three people. And by the end of it, he was not only up here, but I'm, I'm sorry. Right? If Steve wins and the other two lose, does that mean Jesus was wrong? Does that mean we interpreted that incorrectly? Does, does that make these people less credible? Or does what actually happens, these people yell at these people for then using Jesus the wrong way, even though they used him the right way because clearly they lost. But what, what are we talking about? This is why it doesn't work. Because Jesus didn't come to be a part of the system. Jesus came to create a new kingdom. He came to create the kingdom of heaven. He came to teach about how we should treat each other, how we should love one another, how, and this is a big one, right? How he died for everybody who's playing the game and gave everybody the opportunity who's playing to be a part of this new thing, this, this new kingdom, this way of serving and loving God and being closer to him in the way that we were intended to in the first place. The invitation is there for everybody. And of course, what happens when we do this is not only we don't know who won, we don't know who lost, but then we get angry at the other people, right? If you're the winner and you're happy the other one's lost, but you take that into a kingdom mindset, what are we talking about here? Whew, that's big. But the problem is, is that Jesus didn't come to be a part of one of those three things. There's a, a, a portion of Scripture in Philippians where Jesus talks about how he didn't come to support just one piece of the puzzle, he came to establish something new. Uh, Reverend Dr. Michael F. Byrd, who's the ac academic dean of Ridley College, he sums it up really well. This is a bit of a longer quote, just um, so you're ready for it, but I, I think this summarizes it well. He says, it's far more likely um, that Jesus, the man and exalted Lord, does not neatly fit into any side of the political spectrum. The Jew from Nazareth cuts across traditional political lines. No party owns him, as if the Lord of the cosmos could be owned. Jesus does not answer to political super PACs and cannot be made to utter political endorsements on cue. Jesus cannot be mapped into, let alone owned, by the political divide. For people who are serious, listen to this, People who are serious about following Jesus and how to live out their faith in Him, it's not a question as to whether Jesus believes in our politics. Rather, the real question has to be whether we believe in Jesus and His kingdom as a challenge to our politics. This is what they were dealing with. This is why they crucified Him. In other words, for Christians, the point of contention should not be whether Jesus was more conducive to you know, the left or the right, but whether we are prepared to break from the polarization of our politics to engage in a more authentic 
mode of discipleship. Discipleship does get lost when we choose sides, doesn't it? Because then when we choose sides, there are people that we choose not to disciple, which is actually a really big problem. To follow Jesus will inevitably require us to walk away from long-held political loyalties, to reorder our lives around a new constellation of values shaped by Jesus' teaching, his example, his death, his resurrection, and his lordship over all things. Jesus does not mean being uh, following Jesus. And this is that last part that I made sure I put there in for you. Following Jesus does not mean being apolitical or becoming disinterested in the affairs of government. It means the opposite. Being a follower of Jesus means trying to forge our own political values based upon the story and symbols of Jesus himself according to his kingdom, his teaching, and according to the faith delivered once and for all to all the saints. Jesus' way is the way of love for the poor and prophesying truth. Jesus came not to pick a side, right? The Jews were so excited for the Messiah. This is the whole, this is like, this is the big reversal in the story, right? Because the Jewish people were so excited because here is our Messiah. He is going to uh, take us out of the tyranny of the government from under which we live and set us free. But really what Jesus came to do was set everybody free. And even they couldn't see that in the moment. But hopefully we, with a bit of a further out lens, can see that. Jesus is greater than politics because the kingdom of heaven is greater than any other kingdom we can possibly have on earth, right? Jesus is greater than our politics because the kingdom of heaven is greater than any kingdom on earth. He didn't come to conquer the Romans the way the Jews thought. He didn't come to advocate for one group or another. Jesus said, you're all my children and I will lift you up together. And everybody once I die and rise again, we'll have the opportunity to come and be part of this new kingdom with me. And so as we <laughs> exit a very political time in the history of the world, really, of our country for sure, as we enter into an election season, if you're in Ontario, if you're watching from home, we're Ontario, that's it's going to be something that's happening soon. My challenge for you is as you start to establish the things that you think, who you might want to vote for, what, you, what, you, what you're looking at, I want you to be aware of how Scripture and how the words of Jesus are used in those moments. I want you to be able to focus that, filter it through first your theology instead of your ideology, but also kingdom of God language versus kingdom of the earth language. I want you to actively try to do that. And remember, <clears throat> remember when I said at the beginning that um, if you hear something you don't like, you should probably lean into that. So uh, maybe I haven't said anything so much today that you wouldn't like that much, but when the candidate that you like does the thing that I just said, that's when you're going to not like it. Does that make sense? When the candidate does the thing that I just said, the candidate that you like, that you want to vote for, misuses or misquotes Jesus or Scripture, you have to notice it now. And when you see it, you can choose to ignore it, or you can choose to go, oh, do I think like that? Do I do that in my conversations? Do I build arguments around that? Because at the end of the day, Jesus didn't come to support one side or another. Jesus came to establish something new. And as we lead in towards Easter, not only did he think it was so important to be able to establish the kingdom of God and have everybody be able to come in to the family and have that opportunity, but he was willing to die on a cross for it to happen. So before we sort of get a little high and mighty on our thoughts and our ideologies, 
and we, before we cherry pick the one verse that we know fits the thing that we fit, let's look at the message of Jesus as a whole. Let's see what he was actually here to do and what he was here to accomplish. And let's just make sure we check ourselves a little bit to make sure that when we're representing Christ um, to our friends, to our family, to the people that we work with, the people that we know, people that maybe don't have a relationship with him yet, we're not representing some political figure, but we're absolutely actually representing a person who is much greater than men. Amen? Okay, let's pray together. God, thanks so much for this morning. Thank you for sending Christ Jesus to us. Thank you for sending Jesus to us to teach us how to live, to teach us how to treat people well, and for challenging us to reorient us on how to think, um, to how to approach other people, to how to love and care on how to forgive and have mercy and empathy and compassion. And God, I pray that as our pride sort of gets in our way every once in a while, that you would just work on that in us. It's not going to be perfect all the time. We know that, but God, I just pray that you would work on that. Let us see your kingdom past our own. Let us not get caught up all the time in the world in which we live, but let's look to you and what you've established and what you've promised and what the cross promised and what your death and resurrec resurrection promised. So God, we can live as free people in the name of Jesus. That we can bring other people to you in a way that is helpful and accessible to them. And God, that we would just have your, your, your love and your Holy Spirit and your mercy on us each and every day, helping us through that. In Jesus' name, amen.